Hey guys, so the luxury supersonic crosses the Atlantic Ocean in just three hours. It's the most comfortable, expensive, and safest plane currently in the world. It's the latest in air technology, but all the supersonic planes were taken out of use in the early 21st century, and new ones haven't appeared yet. Why did this happen, and is it all because of the one and only crash of the Concorde? Today, we're going to talk about the secret flaw in all the supersonic planes. First, let's review some historical events. Ah, the 1960s, the epic range of the Cold War. The Soviet Union and the West strived to show that their country's machines were better and more effective. In such conditions as supersonic transport, was more than just a way to fly from one city to another. Supersonic is more of an image project that gives you plus 100 to status, and that's really its only upside. Supersonic airliners were actually completely useless. Of course, flying from the US to Europe in three and a half hours is astounding, but a ticket on the supersonic cost $8,000. In comparison, the legendary Ford Mustang in its base version cost $2,820, meaning you could buy two sports cars for $8,000 and still fly to Paris and back in business class on a Boeing plane. But all that mattered was bringing prestige to your country. So Europe, America, and the Soviet Union spent all their efforts on creating supersonic transport. The leader in this race was the UK. So in 1956, the English developed the supersonic Bristol 233 transport plane. The Delta II supersonic fighter served as the base for the project. The Delta was where characteristics of the 1970s supersonic were first seen. These traits included a tailless design, Delta-shaped wings, and a movable nose cone. The project was successful, but very expensive. Now at the same time, Developers in France worked on their own supersonic transport, the Super Caravelle. The British and French joined their efforts and began the Concorde project in 1962. Seven years later, the first British French supersonic completed a test flight and was commissioned for use 14 years later. In total, the project cost $2 billion. Now, in the late 1960s, the Concorde was incredibly cool and even big for modern standards, with triangular wings and an impressive cruising speed of 1,317 miles per hour. The practical flight range was 4,020 miles, its max speed was 1,355 miles per hour, and its max altitude was 11.4 miles. The designers put four modified Olympus 593 jet engines from the Avro Vulcan bomber on the Concorde. This let it fly at speeds of Mach 2. At such speeds, the plane's covering heated up to 266 degrees Fahrenheit, even 11 miles in the air where the air is freezing cold. The designers created a unique heat exchange system to solve the problem, but the Concorde windows were still hot enough to burn skin. And it wasn't the only unique solution. A loaded Concorde weighed 188 tons and landed at speeds of 190 miles per hour. This behemoth's braking distance was much longer than the normal runway. But the designers didn't let that get in the way, and they actually solved the problem by developing a braking system that was fully electronically controlled. That resulted in the supersonic Concorde completely stopping 5,250 feet from where it landed. Also, the Concorde that cost 23 million English pounds at the time was extremely comfortable, had leather seats, and could carry from 92 to 128 passengers. Even in the narrowest parts of the plane, the designers put the seats far enough apart for passengers to not bump elbows. Champagne, caviar sandwiches, and beautiful flight attendants all displayed the highest class. Thanks to the effective noise-canceling system on board, it was quiet 
even when the engines were working at full power. Of course, there was the unbelievable speed, too. Just imagine getting on the plane in London at daybreak and landing in New York also at daybreak. It would be like time stopped. Another of the Concorde's hits was the special flight on December 31st, where passengers could celebrate the New Year several times on the flight, raise glasses of the best champagne, and eat tons of delicious French food. In 2000, there was a round-the-world charter Concorde flight. Over 24 days, passengers who paid $62,000 per ticket could partake in the first-class cuisine, champagne, and caviar, as well as spend two to three days in exotic locales such as Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, China, Hong Kong, India, Kenya, and France. It would be perfect. But the supersonic plane burned through over 18 tons of fuel per hour of flying. A Boeing 747 that's twice as large only burns 14 tons. The plane was refueled with over 95 tons of kerosene to provide it with fuel during the flight. So on July 25th, 2000, these 95 tons exploded, and the cause was a 16-inch long titanium strip that accidentally separated from the other plane's engine. At 174 miles per hour, the Concorde flew into that piece of metal and pierced its tire. The 10-pound fragment of hard rubber flew upwards and punched a hole into the fuel tank, causing a leak. The pilots felt the blow but couldn't stop, and the plane was knocked airborne. The liner shot up, and the leaking fuel caught fire in the engine exhaust. The captain tried to fly to the nearest airport with the three remaining engines, but another one soon failed, and the burning plane crashed into a small hotel in a small town near Paris. The smoke and flames stretched 985 feet into the sky. Two years after the incident, all Concorde planes were grounded permanently. European specialists insist the only reason for the decision to kill the Concorde project, whose planes were absolutely reliable, with over two decades free of accidents, was because they were too expensive, they took too much fuel, and it wouldn't have been easier to fuel them with cash. Another factor that affected the lifespan of all supersonic transports was that they could only be used on routes that crossed oceans so they wouldn't break the sound barrier over cities. Two years after the incident, all Concorde planes were grounded permanently. Now, the Soviet Tu-144 supersonic airliner took off two months earlier than the European Concorde did, but it flew much less. The Soviet wanted to get their plane in the air first at any price, which meant much needed to be sacrificed. You could say it wasn't the most comfortable plane. The Tu-144 cabin was smaller, the seats were harder, and the toilets only worked every other time. Because of poor noise cancelling, passengers on board had to shout, or get this, pass notes to communicate. Vibrations on the Tu-144 were so strong that passengers were warned in advance, don't be scared, the plane isn't falling apart. That's just the engines working. Overall, it wasn't much like the luxury Concorde at all and it had worse characteristics at that. Its max speed was 1,380 miles per hour, 44 miles per hour slower than the Concorde, and its flight range varied from 1,865 to 2,485 miles, depending on the model. Even its max range was 1,550 miles less than its European counterpart. Western researchers regularly say that the Soviet Union simply stole the concept of the supersonic passenger plane, and they have two main arguments. First, the obvious similarity in designs, which can't be argued with. Second, the Tu-144 repeats several designs that the European researchers call unique, like the movable nose cone. The Soviet Tu-144 definitely couldn't have gotten that by coincidence. Well, no matter what, the plane had a series of failures. In 1973, the Tu-144 
crashed during an expo at Le Bourget, and all six crew members died. Everything went according to the program on the June 2nd flights, but the English-French Concorde looked more impressive. It landed, stopped, reversed, and took off from the middle of the runway, which demonstrably showed the superior takeoff and landing abilities of the plane. The TU-144 couldn't do this. So that's why, according to several witnesses, a small group decided to execute a zoom climb the next day to draw everyone's attention. The plane was getting ready to land with its landing gear out and canards extended, but they retracted the landing gear and put the engines at full power. The TU-144 entered its zoom climb. However, the plane couldn't even out horizontally and started diving, falling apart at 394 feet. One wing broke off at first, followed by the tail section. Now, the reason for the crash is undetermined. But a year later, a TU-144 engine burned up during a test for long flights, and the crew made an emergency landing. Two onboard engineers died who couldn't escape the plane after landing. And after the second tragedy, Soviet leadership decided to cancel passenger flights on the TU-144. Now, while the USSR and Europe were competing, the American company Boeing developed its own version of a supersonic passenger plane. The National Supersonic Transport Program began on June 5, 1963, mainly initiated by JFK, and included projects from Boeing, Lockheed, and North American. However, Boeing fairly quickly overtook its competition, and on December 31, 1966, a government committee approved their continuation on their project. Engines for the new plane were provided by General Electric. At first, Boeing was aiming for the following characteristics. A flight range of no less than 4,190 miles and a cruising speed of 1,800 miles per hour. The original passenger amount was 277, but it was increased to 300 during development. Unique attributes of the design included movable sweep wings, which has never been used in passenger planes since. It was an original and economically profitable idea in theory, but in practice it turned out that the wide fuselage and super wings were too heavy. Designers suggested making the frame out of titanium to compensate, but that made the budget balloon to astronomical values. So, like the Concorde and TU-144, the Boeing 2707 lowered its now cone in front of the cockpit to improve visibility during landing. But it had its own quirk. The nose end had a bend when lowered, and its end was parallel to the ground. The problem of increasing the amount of passenger flow became a major one. They either needed to increase the speed or seat capacity. In the end, they chose the second option for many reasons. The main ones were the doubtful cost-effectiveness of supersonic planes, the difficulty in developing them and in their future maintenance. Since the engineers had already spent everything on their baby, the Boeing 747, they decided to focus on that, and the Boeing 2707 project lost government funding and was closed in 1971, which actually turned out to be a very practical decision in the long run. Well, that's all for today. Be sure to leave a like, comment, let me know, would you have ridden in a Concorde? I would have just to be able to celebrate New Year's in London and New York. That's pretty cool. And uh, we'll see you again next time.